Now, I think we all know that Jesus Christ is both God and man. And this divine person, Jesus Christ, as we all know, he, he didn't treat people with a dominant manner, or he didn't even treat people in a cold manner. Now, when Jesus serves, we see sometimes he had a mercy sight. And the Bible says that he moved with pity. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. And in some occasion, we saw Jesus, he wept for his own people. Jesus wept. And there's some joyful element in the life of Christ. He rejoiced in the Spirit because the Father revealed the hidden truth to his own people. And Christ also joyfully protected and kept his people. But in the other occasions, we also saw Jesus. He had anger. As we all know, he was angry with those Pharisees, scribes, who defied the temple in the Gospels. And also, he, he was also angry with his own disciple that he forbids. They forbade all the children came to them, came to Jesus, and Jesus angrily rebuilt his own disciples. Now, I wonder... We as a Christian, when we call ourselves as a disciple of Christ, when we see the affection of Christ, do we all imitate the same affection like Jesus? To cry, to weep, and to joy, to feel joyful, and to have mercy in the right time, in the right situation into the right person. Now, my friends, we really need to learn from Jesus about his affections. As we turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 8, if we look at verse 8, you will see that for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ. I wonder, do we all imitate that kind of affections? towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do we have that kind of affections to your own biological family members to cry, to feel happy, and to get angry sometimes at your family members? So Christ modeled for us the perfection of the affections, and that kind of affections flows into the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, the Bible described Paul's close relationship with the Philippian church. He constantly remembering and praying for the church. But he also rightly says that our prayers need to be centered on the affection of Christ. Because most of the time, our prayers is just merely speaking something. But sometimes we forget that prayer also, it is a way to speak to God, to express our feelings, thoughts, things happening around us to God alone. So in this way, in prayer, we can actually express Christ-like emotions, affections of sorrow, joy for the church. Now with that being said, do you rejoice when there is truth being preached in the church? Do you get angry? When the church is committing sin, in your prayers, do you shed tears for your church? In the word, do you have affection and feelings for the church, like Jesus or like the Apostle Paul? Now, we all need to follow Paul's example to have that kind of affection for the church, to be mindful for our family in Christ, so today, I want to encourage all of us, including myself, that we all need to learn to pray for the church, often with Christ's affection. But what is Christ-centered prayer? First of all, as we can see from the book of Philippians, the Christ-centered prayer is always be mindful of the church with the affection of Christ. Now here Paul says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. 
So Christ's center prayer is always be mindful of the church. As we jump down a little bit to verse 5, you will see that the reason why the Apostle Paul was so happy and joyful to the point that he could pray for the church was because God has already gave him many gospel partners, many co-workers, many elders, many disciples, many church members who really can work with the Apostle Paul. Then Paul could give thanks to God. But later in the few chapters, we will see that the Philippine church was not always that good. There's something wrong with this church. Some believers really hurt Paul. And Paul was really disappointed and sad about that. Now hear this, Paul's prayer were not only limited, limited to those brothers and sisters who were good, lovable, approachable, but to all, including those who were struggling, suffering, or even unpleasant to the church. Because in the church, honestly, we will encounter some lovable members, but some not so lovable. And the question is, would you pray for those unlovable members? It's easy for us to pray for similar-minded brothers and sisters, but not everyone in the church. Are you willing to pray for all of us? Now, that's a big challenge because we often had two kinds of problems. First of all, it's not our habits to pray for anyone, every member in the church. And the second problem is we don't want to pray for those we dislike. Now, to overcome this, we must learn from Christ. Because John, in the Gospel of John 17, John gave us a glimpse of Christ's prayer for his own people. And that's the whole list that we can see how John is praying, how John described Jesus was praying for his own disciple. Now, Jesus prayed for his disciple to be with him. Jesus prayed for his own people pray for his disciple in the world, pray for his disciple to be sanctified, and etc. But seeing this example of Christ, remember, Peter, in some point, he betrayed Christ. In his group of discipleship, there are some disciples who were so ashamed of Jesus' ministry and there are some disciples, they ran away when Jesus was about to be crucified. And that were the kind of disciple that Jesus was shepherding with. But Jesus still prayed with them, still prayed for them, still prayed for their own benefits. But how can we put this into the practice? And I think small groups are the platform, a really good platform for sharing the prayer items. So in our small groups, try to be specific as possible so that we have more directions in our prayers. Because most of the time, when we share our prayer items, we mostly share in the most general way, but we hide most, our, most of our weaknesses and our struggles. But I think, personally, Sharing witnesses is the key to leading breakthroughs in lives. When I used to lead cell groups in the past, there were two main situations. The first was sharing the prayer points in general way, or maybe they're not sharing any prayer points at all. And the second situation was most of the members, they they're willing to share their own witnesses and invite the church or the small group to pray for them. Now, what I've learned over the past 10 years is that the small groups, those small groups that are willing to share their own witnesses and watch and pray for each other tend to have a deep relationships and have the deepest relationship, a profound relationship. A few years ago, when I was leading a small group, we were doing the same thing, sharing from the Bible, reflecting, and committing to some practice and application. It's all the same thing. 
and suddenly one of the wives broke down in tears. We had no idea what to do. She confessed that she was facing a crisis in her own marriage. Now, usually these kind of problems were unsavory among many people. So most people tend to hide all those struggles and witnesses in some of the corners of their lives. So when she shared her struggles, our group began to pray for her and minister to her as much as we could. Now, to make a long story short, after a few months, the problem was solved. But when we walked and talked with them, we found out that there were many unbiblical habits and value in their marriage and lives. We need to tell them to leave some practices, to leave some misconceptions. But at some moment, we also need to invite her husband to have some talk, to have some coffee. Those processes were not easy. It's never easy to settle the issues in the church, especially human issues. But that process was really precious. By that time, we really gained a deep understanding on how Christ really cried for his church, how Christ really had mercy for his church, and how Christ was really joyful when Christ redeemed his own people. And that's the affection of Christ. That process was really precious. Now, in the future, this small group, they all began to realize that the importance of life transformation, not only they share their own witnesses willingly, confidentially, but they also commit themselves to help each other in the life issues. So to each other, we were like the pastors, counselors, and teachers. Now, I strongly believe that one of the ways to grow the church is to learn to share your witnesses and then ask your small group, ask your church to pray for you, to minister for you. And that's one of the functions of the church. You're here to be healed by the Word of God and by the communion and relationship in Christ. So the Christ-centered prayer is always praying for your own church. Pray for your members. But as we pray for your members, we can also thank God for them. And that comes to the second point, always be thankful for the work of God. Here the Apostle Paul says this, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began the good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of and the confirmation of the gospel. Now you see, Paul had a close relationship with the Philippian church. The partnership Gospel partnership can be seen in several ways. There are one mind in the gospel of Christ, there are one mind in supporting Paul's personal needs, and there are one mind forever. The church stands with Paul, the church pray for Paul, and the church preach the gospel with Paul. While Paul were in prison, they knew the needs of Paul and they sent the money and the same sent the material needs from their own pocket money to take care of Paul. And but but this kind of gospel partnership is just not just temporarily, it's forever. It's long lasting. The Philippine church knew this. Now that also reminds us that we need to be of one mind in the ministry of Christ because there is no such thing as a solo Christian. If there is less giving, less caring, less love, less sharing in the ministry, there is no unity and the church will not grow. So Paul think he gave thanks to God for the Philippian church because it was God who made the Philippian church willing to commit themselves 
in the gospel ministry because Paul says this, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Give thanks to God for some service and ministry in the church. Now this verse also is quoted as God's work of salvation as well. In other words, a person who is saved by God, who believes in the death and the resurrection of Christ for him will never be lost. God is able to save his people to the end. Now, some people often think that one day we may lose our salvation or that God will forsake us to the point that some people will get terrified and confused that, oh, one day I might go to hell. One day I might lose my salvation in this Christian's journey. But the good news of the gospel tells us that those who truly believe in Christ, as Paul said, those who truly believe in Christ, God will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon has a wonderful explanation to this in the context of God's creation. And he said this, where is there an instance of God's beginning any work and leaving it incomplete? Show me for once a world abandoned and thrown aside half form. Show me a universe cast off from the great potter's will, which is God. With the design in outline, the clay half hardened and the half and the form unshapely from incompleteness. So just like how God created the world and continues to protect and keep it, so God will not leave us when we come into Christ, believe in Christ. And God says this, He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's the best proof that God will keep you in Christ until we meet our Lord Jesus. Now here is the gospel. My friends, if you are troubled and doubtful in your faith journey, this is a solid confirmation to you. If you have repented of your sin, turn from them and trust in Jesus Christ with all your heart, you will always and forever be saved in Christ. But for those who are still exploring their faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel worthy of your trust. And I pray that God will open your eyes and believe Jesus Christ as your Savior. However, God does not just only keep his people forever. Sinners who have been transformed by God, they will actively involve in the work of the gospel and they will have a deeper relationship, friendship, than biological brothers and sisters. And that is what say Paul says in verse 5, the partnership in the gospel. And especially in verse 7, we see, For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. The Philippine church was willing to bear Paul's burden, whether he was on trial or in his suffering or in prison. One of the sisters that I knew before, she was greatly falsely accused by her company and she had to seek justice from the court. Now we must know that the cost of the lawsuit is high. Even if you win the case, you won't get the money back. And the sister, she wasn't a rich person and she did not have much money to pay for her lawsuit. Many lawyers refused to defend for her. And only one Christian lawyer said that, tell me what's going on with your case with your problem, and I will handle the rest. And furthermore, you know what? The pastor of a church never missed the sister's lawsuit. And the sister was confused, and she told pastor, hey, pastor, you're so busy with visitation, teaching, mentoring, counseling, and every stuff in the church. You don't need to come to visit me in the court. And the pastor responded in this way, my dear sister, 
I don't really know the details of the law in this case, but I only know one thing: you are my sister in Christ, and I need to be there to support you in the court. She was touched by this, and later on, she learned that the whole church had been praying urgently for this matter, supporting financially material needs for the sister. In the end. She won the lawsuit and proved her innocent. Throughout this process, the church shared the sister's pain and suffering. Now, compared to Philippian church, we must confess that how changeable we are. Unlike the Philippian church, today we are taught that my business is my business, not your business. The Philippian church shows us that the church business is your business. We can reflect on how. How is our consideration of our church members? Are we grateful, like Paul, that he gave thanks for the service and the ministry of the church? Are we like the Philippian church, taking out up your burdens? Onto my shoulder, and saying that your business is my business. As Paul said, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because you, I hold you in my heart. Do we all hold each other in our hearts? Now, my friend, let us learn to see the work of God in the church. Give thanks for the church members, because. We are saved by the grace of God, because that's the work of the salvation of God. And second, give thanks and praise God for the brothers and sisters who willingly, who sacrifice themselves for the church. Now we not only remember the church, give thanks to God, but we must also pray for the growth of the church. We need to pray for the growth of the church. Here, Paul says this, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all the sermons, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, here's. Here can be our prayer point. We can pray like Paul: "Love may abound more and more with knowledge and all the sermon." Now, that's not to say that the Philippian church had no any action of love. Paul was praying for the quality of love would continue to grow. Don't stop loving. Keep growing. Keep committing yourself into the church and keep loving. But why is it necessary to add love to knowledge and discernment? Think of a scientist who has all knowledge. Think of a teacher. Think of a pastor. Think of everyone who can have all knowledge. A scientist can design and create different kinds of technologies. But if the scientist does not understand human needs. The product that technology he creates will only satisfy his own desire, but it will be a disaster for the mankind. Likewise, Christians who are filled with much biblical philosophical knowledge, but do not love, that will only be a noise that won't edify the church. So, conversely, we cannot have love without knowledge and the sermon. Because that would turn love into a blind love, but in any case, love is the most important thing. When our knowledge grow, when our discernment grow, our love must grow. But our difficult is, we find it hard to grow our love. We find it hard to love people. But in Paul's prayer, he shows us the way to increase the love. Paul prayed for love to increase in two areas: 
in knowledge and discernment, and they are the ways, they are the tools for us to increase our love. Now, this knowledge is not a general knowledge like bio, med, science, and etc. But Paul connects this kind of knowledge with God. It is a knowledge of God, the knowledge related to God. If you turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, you will see that Paul says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleaded to dwell. Any riches, any knowledge, any wisdom, anything, all of the things and graces and blessings are in Christ. Proverbs 1, 7 also says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the knowledge. So if you want to increase your love, you must learn from Christ because true knowledge, true wisdom only can be found in Christ. And Paul goes on to pray for the growth of love through the sermon. It is the ability to distinguish between good and evil and to make the right judgment accordingly to do the right thing, to say the right thing, and to choose the most valuable thing for people. So that kind of love will always ask its ourselves, okay, now I want to love you, but how, what is the right way to speak to you? What is the right way to bring some impact to you? And what should I do to meet your needs? And then our love will have a direction because we don't just randomly love people. So my friends, true love is not blind. Love needs to know how to serve and love needs to be taught with knowledge. Having said that, unless we serve we, with love, all knowledge and all discernment we have, it's all noise and a waste. Because Paul said very clear in the first Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul defined love in many ways. As we have just read from the, from the um, scripture reading section just now. He, define, he defines love in this way. Love is patient and kind. Do we apply our knowledge and make discernment with patience and kindness? It is not envy or boast. Do we envy our members in the church or do we boast of having some kinds of knowledge? It is not arrogant or rude. Now, we might have some sharp discernment, but when we express our discernment and concern, do we express those concerns in an offensive and rude manner with no regards with people's feeling, although that's a good discernment? It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love never ends. Now, brothers and sisters, if you add this love to your knowledge and discernment, and I tell you that the growth of the church is just around the corner, do we learn to love the people? Do we want to love people? If we would like our love to grow, you need to learn from Jesus how he loves his people. That's the knowledge. And see and discern the true needs of people in our circumstances and then love them. It's a cycle. Love, discern, receive the knowledge, and then love. Now see, brothers and sisters, that when the church abounds in love, in knowledge, and in insight, and in discernment, Paul shows us two kinds of results. 
that the church may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. When a church behaves in love, she will always choose what is right, most appropriate, and most valuable for the others. People will know that the church is sincere. There is no hidden agenda in the church. And the second of all is the church will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ and then give praise and glory to God. Righteousness is the standard of God. If we, if the church behave in the standard of God, the world will see that the church standard is different from the world. Even if the world persecute the church, and we in that point also give glory to God because we all walk in the standard of God. If we love, if we abide ourselves in love, God's name is then glorified and people will give praise to God. So my friends, do you desire to see the church always make the right choice and be a loving church? Stop praying for the church that love may abound more and more in discernment and knowledge. So here's the invitation, my friends. The church needs your prayers. You need to pray for the members of the church. Give thanks to God for them. Pray for the church that the church can grow in love, in the field of knowledge and discernment. Because none of us want to see the church collapse. We all want to see the church be a church that is after God's own heart. So let's start by praying for each other. From this day onwards, follow Christ's example in your prayers for the church. How can we pray for the church? Be like Christ. How he feels and have emotion and affections for the church. But what should we pray for the church? Always put your members in your prayer. Always give thanks for them. And always pray that they will grow in Christ. And let's pray together. Father, as we come before you, we give thanks to you of the graces and blessings we enjoy. Thank you we see many brothers and sisters willing to sacrifice the time and effort in this church to be Sunday school teachers, to be the teachers for the foundation of faith, and to be the ushers, and to be the liturgies. We thank you for those brothers and sisters and even some members who contribute lightly or heavily. Thank you, Father. But Father, we pray for this church that this church will always abound in love, abide in love more and more, not just increase in love, but also increase in knowledge and discernment. We also pray that this church will be a good name, will also be, will also be glorifying your name always, that when people see it is not us, they will see Christ in us. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.